Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Reed. Uh, please bear with me. I do have a cold, and I'll try not to hack too much into the microphone. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's snowing in Montana, so that makes it even more of a pleasure. Uh, and great to be back with my good friend, Reed. And uh, Jim and I interacted some at Stanford, uh, so it's good to be back with him. We'll see what sort of barbs he has uh, in the Q&A. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, not have them say that <laughs> Uh, I have, when they describe your undergraduate degree, they say I have a BS degree, and I figure that's sort of redundant for a professor. Uh, uh, so what I'd like to do is just dive right in. We're going to try and keep my remarks at 25 minutes and then let uh, Jim take, uh, make a few remarks and, and then engage you, I hope. Now, I understand there's a combination of law students and Nicholas School students, and so, so uh, some of this will be... Uh, just uh, a bit redundant at the outset for you, uh, for others it may be old hat. So let me just get, get started right away. There's some background that will be necessary. As Reed mentioned, I have a PhD in economics and, and we'll, we'll be using a lot of economic analysis here. Now to get started here, I want you to just understand that economists are very interested in the notion of trade-offs. And so uh, uh, we care about, uh, well let me get back here. Sorry, uh, we care about the trade-offs between such things as labor and capital and resources and, and how you can trade those things off along these sort of isoquants. Uh, but if you've had any economics, isoquants are nothing to you. So let me just move right along to uh, how we can take those isoquants and, and use them uh, in another very important way to get to this thing called the uh, uh, resource conversion path here, which comes from, well, from a bunch of tangencies and, and other intersection points there. Uh, and, and you can, I mean, these things are really very useful in policy analysis, as I'm sure uh, all of you know. Now, the lawyers here may have a little trouble with this technical stuff, but that, you, you know, it, you, you might want to uh, take an econ course if you don't follow all this. Uh, and then uh, what's really useful if, if you keep going is, is you can take all this stuff and put it together into another nice set of graphs. 
Uh, and, and this set of graphs shows uh, the WWs here are the welfare functions for the society. And uh, you can combine those with the BB line, uh, which is the production frontier for all intents and purposes. And you put those things together, and it allows you to get to omega, which is a very important point. That's the bliss point. Uh, I'm putting you on. That's the last of the graphs. Uh, but these are graphs that I took from uh, uh, a very famous article in economics, one that I had to suffer through as a grad student. And I can remember very distinctly getting through all of these and thinking, can you imagine, here you are being endowed with a set of tools that will get society to its bliss point. I mean, that should make you invaluable, right? Everybody would like to be at their bliss point. Uh, and uh, so after going through all of these trade-offs and tangencies and minimum points and intersections and, and thinking you could get there, finding that actually not too many people listen to this kind of nonsense unless it's a captive audience that gets burritos. Uh, so people are, are sort of looking at this like, you know, what does an economist have to add to public policy? And in fact, that may explain, uh, uh, there, there are lots of jokes about economists. Uh, you know, if you laid all the economists in the world end to end, they wouldn't reach a conclusion. If you laid all the economists end to end, it would be a good thing. And recently I was asked, you know what an economist is, don't you? And the answer, which I didn't know but was told, is it's someone who's pretty good with numbers but doesn't have enough personality to be an accountant. Uh, and my guess is that it's graphs like the three I just put up that add to that reputation and uh, uh, believe you me, we as economists do our best to maintain that reputation by showing that we have uh, little personality and when it comes to environmental issues, little heart. Uh, and so Reed's comment about uh, how can you be an economist and, and, uh, and an environmentalist at the same time is very appropriate. Well, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about environmental policy from an econ economist point of view. And uh, <clears throat> I want to use an example very near and dear uh, to the hearts of people who live on the northern border of Yellowstone, namely wolf reintroduction. And I think it provides a, a useful way of, of, of thinking about how economists would approach a problem and then why it is that an economic approach isn't very useful. And ultimately, I want to then uh, bring it to a policy uh, approach that, that definitely involves aspects of the law. So we might ask the question of, what about wolf reintroduction? Good thing, bad thing. Now, the economist has no trouble with this. The economist says, well, it's simple. You put on the economist's hat, and you say, should we reintroduce wolves? Well, we want to know. Are the benefits greater than the costs? And I used to teach uh, 250 students at a WAC and intro econ. And when they couldn't answer a question, I would train them to, to be the choir. And the question, the answer to almost any question in economics can be, if the marginal benefits are greater than the marginal costs, do it. And so uh, should we reintroduce wolves? If the marginal benefits are greater than the marginal costs, do it. And uh, that's very simple, of course getting at what are those benefits and what are those costs is a, a whole other uh, aspect of, of uh, what economists get paid to do. Uh, and it's, it's, it's nice to, to think in those terms, but it's much more difficult to come up with the notion of should we reintroduce wolves based on pure economic analysis of that sort. And then, of course, it's not just a question of, of uh, should we, but then and we're going through this now because we did reintroduce wolves under the Clinton administration when uh, Secretary Babbitt uh, came to uh, uh, Yellowstone and brought in the uh, immigrants from uh, Canada, uh, turned them loose in the park. Uh, I believe there were 19 in the original release. There are now somewhere around 450 in the greater Yellowstone area and something closer to 700 plus if you take a sweep from Yellowstone over into Idaho, northern uh, uh, or parts of northern Wyoming and, and now even a few showing up in, in places like Colorado and Utah. And uh, so now the question might be, well, what's the optimal number of wolves? We, we reintroduce them, what's the optimal number? Again, the answer is, well, if the marginal benefits are greater than the marginal cost of additional wolves, then we should have additional wolves. Once again, that, that sort of... Uh, 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 song is, is easy to play, but, but uh, not everybody sees things in the same way. And so I thought in keeping with uh, wearing different hats, I'd put on 
the hat of uh, one of the people in this, uh, this picture here, this guy here perhaps, uh, and uh, you go out and you ask uh, uh, the people who wear this hat, what's the optimal number of wolves? And they would say, we had the optimal number. We got there. We had none. That was the right number of wolves, and we spent a lot of time getting to that number. So why should we have added any to it? The marginal benefits of an additional wolf are, are definitely uh, not very high, and the marginal cost to these people are very high because they're the ones who worry that maybe their calves or their, their lambs are being eaten by, uh, <coughs> by these wolves. So the person wearing this hat has a very, very different view of what wolf reintroduction is all about. And, and I might uh, now put on a hat that if I were home this week, I'd, I'd be wearing because it's the opening week of the hunting season. Uh, and uh, might ask, well, how do hunters feel about wolves? This one's a little tougher, right? Because you're not quite sure wearing this hat whether you want to be out there hunting a bull elk or whether you want to be out there uh, uh, hunting wolves. Now, uh, the wolves are listed as an endangered species in some parts of the country. When they were reintroduced, there was a special uh, category for them so they could be uh, uh, exterminated, uh, killed if, if they were causing, if they were trouble wolves. Uh, and, but, and, and you definitely, hunters can't go out and, and uh, shoot them legally at least. Uh, so the hunters are sort of looking at it and say, well, you know, where the deer and the antelope uh, play. And they're saying big bull elk like this used to be very abundant in Yellowstone. They migrate out of the park at this time of year because of the deep snows in Yellowstone and come down into their winter ranges and then they become prey species for us. Uh, that is, we get to hunt them. If you look now, and I have a, a, a good friend who's doing a research project on the impact of wolf reintroduction on hunting, especially in the areas where there are lots of wolves, and the fact of the matter is not many people hunt there anymore because the number of elk has gone way down. Now, lots of explanations for that, and I'm not here to debate the science behind it, but the point again is, what's the optimal number of wolves? depends a lot on the hat you wear. And <coughs> we might also ask the question, of, well, what's the optimal number of, hat, of, of wolves if you wear yet another hat? This is really my favorite of all. Uh, suppose that you indeed are uh, uh, a member of the National Park Service, and you're the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park. Now, this is the north entrance of Yellowstone at Gardner, Montana. Uh, if you go through the north entrance, uh, there's a road that connects Gardner with a little town called Cook City on the northeast corner of Yellowstone. Before wolf reintroduction, you could have driven that road on any winter day. It's kept open during the winter. You could have driven that road on any winter day, and if you'd had car trouble, you would be there most of the winter. It was hardly used at all. The only people who went there were a few people who cross-country skied. Today, if you drive that road, you will come to every turnout and you will see more spotting scopes and telephoto lenses than you ever imagined as people now come to Yellowstone to watch wolves. I meant to bring and didn't, but uh, I have a plastic card that, that you can buy in the curio shops that actually have pictures of all the wolves that are frequently seen and they have numbers. So you, you, know, you can check off. I saw wolf number 2069. Uh, I saw wolf number 172. Uh, and people like bird watchers go there and, you know, get to see their wolves. Uh, it's done a tremendous amount to bolster support for winter visitations to Yellowstone. Uh, and so, given that if you wear this hat, your budgets are largely driven by the number of vehicles that go through that entrance, uh, you're very happy to have wolf reintroduction. To you, the benefits are way up on the third floor and the costs are, are, um, are, are trivial. Well, you put all these together, and not surprisingly, you get what my good friend and author of a book called uh, uh, <coughs> Wolf Wars. In fact, I'll put on the, the hat that Hank Fisher wears, my environmentalist hat. Uh, now, you ask environmentalists what they think about wolf reintroduction, and, and it's very clear. The benefits and costs, well, the benefits, again, are enormous, the costs are fairly low, and uh, so uh, Hank and, and then working for Defenders of Wildlife was instrumental in getting, uh, pushing for the wolf reintroduction in spite of the fact that the people wearing those cowboy hats, black or white, uh, didn't like it. In fact, Hank tells the story of, of early uh, in, the, in the debates 
going to a little town called Ashton, Idaho. It's down on the uh, uh, western border of Yellowstone. Uh, he went in, uh, it's sheep racing country, he went into this uh, little restaurant where the Rotary Club meets on Monday, and, and they were having a public meeting on wolf reintroduction, and Hank got up to speak wearing this hat. Uh, actually, I'm joking, Hank, does, I don't think he wears this hat. I wear it to keep the sweat uh, out of my eyes, and it also can be unfolded into a do-rag, which keeps the sun off the <laughs> glaring off the forehead, uh, <coughs> or the rest of my head. Uh, Hank said he walked in, and somebody in the back of the room, before he even spoke a word, wearing one of these, said, Hank Fisher, ain't nobody shot you yet? Hank said, I knew it was going to be an uphill battle. Uh, so Hank was dealing with this tremendous source of conflict, uh, which came about because you have a whole stack of hats here worn by different people who have very different perceptions of what the benefits and costs are. And the one that matters the least is probably that economist hat. So the question becomes then, what can we do about the tremendous conflict in the wolf wars? And I want to I submit that at the, at, the, at the root of virtually all environmental problems and the conflict that often arises from these environmental problems is are two things. One, changing values or changing demands. If you look back at the whole wolf issue, and if I were to slip back to the slide of cattle grazing, cattle grazed on the public lands around Yellowstone. That was just something that everybody knew existed. Ranchers had permits to graze on those lands. Uh, some would call them grazing rights, but they're permits issued by the federal government. They're secure enough that you can go to a bank and borrow more money on, uh, against your ranch if you have those permits because they do provide valuable grazing in the summer. And so those were the main demands. And, and the hunters, uh, everybody understood that what was driving the economy around uh, Yellowstone in the fall was the hunting clientele, the people who wore those orange hats and flew in on the airplanes and came and hired outfitters and spent three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a week uh, to hunt elk on the border of Yellowstone. <laughs> But we have changing values or changing demands, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. And then secondly, what's driving the conflicts in environmental uh, areas, I think, is unclear property rights. And that'll be a main focus uh, of uh, my conclusion. So let me take those and put them into the context of, of <coughs> how can we resolve conflicts given changing demands and given unclear property rights. And my answer is going to be, as the title of the book that Don Leal and I wrote uh, suggests, what I call, and Don and I call, free market environmentalism. Now, uh, Reed talked about this uh, disconnect between economists and environmental, being an environmentalist. When Don and I published this book, uh, uh, it's now it's a revised edition, but in 1991 we published the first edition, and one reviewer said, free market environmentalism is an oxymoron. And then in a wonderful line, followed it by saying, and Don Leal and Terry Anderson are the moron part. Uh, I always wanted to use that in a review. You know, it's just, it's just, it was just wonderful. Uh, you, you know, even if you were the moron part, you had to appreciate the, the, the uh, great uh, literary talent of the reviewer. Uh, so why was it an oxymoron? Well, people looked at free markets and the environment and said, wait, free markets are these things that go out there and cause pollution and, and overgraze the lands and and cause uh, the government to put subsidies into killing wolves, to stick with that example. Uh, so you've got free markets out there. Uh, maybe they're not even all that free, and they've got monopoly elements. And now you try and shove them together with environmentalism, and indeed, you don't have something that goes together and fits nice uh, and neatly, but rather you have conflicting approaches to how we ought to deal uh, with our, our natural resource, uh, resources. <coughs> so, what I'd like to do is talk just a little bit about what uh, free market environmentalism means to me, and then give you a few examples and uh, suggest uh, how all this fits in with the law. <coughs> well, free market environmentalism is quite simple. Uh, in fact, most of what economists know is quite simple. We just doctor it up with those kind of graphs that I showed you to begin with. And if, if you're really good at economics, you can throw in a little calculus and dazzle people all the more. Uh, <coughs> uh, bamboozle would probably be a better word. Uh, basically, there are two tenets of free market environmentalism. One of them is quite simple. Uh, it's wealth makes a difference. Or as Aaron Wildofsky, a 
late political scientist from Berkeley, put it in a book that he wrote, talking more about, about health issues, but wealthier is healthier. And uh, if I could take Aaron's words, I'd say wealthier is healthier for the environment. Uh, so that's point number one. And point number two is that incentives matter. Uh, and put those two together, and you really have a good, good way of thinking about how free markets and the environment uh, can be harnessed. Uh, or as a rancher puts it on the second one, a rancher friend I was just hunting over on his land, uh, bird hunting a couple of weeks ago, he has, uh, uh, ranchers usually have good ways of putting things. If it pays, it stays. And uh, th this he said when he started implementing a hunting program on his ranch where people like myself would pay a fee to hunt, and all of a sudden he was willing to change his ranching style uh, if in fact, uh, and, and maybe graze less or change his grazing uh, uh, rotation, uh, add vegetation or, or not take away vegetation, uh, because if it paid to have it, he was willing to have it stay there. So let me talk about these two, and, and I'll talk very generally about the wealth matters uh, point uh, first with this graph uh, from UN, uh, UN data. Uh, and it simply shows the correlation between on this axis, GDP per capita, and on this axis, an index of environmental indicators. So uh, if you had uh, an index of 100, you'd be just uh, living in nirvana. Uh, and obviously, if you had an index of zero, you probably couldn't breathe. And <clears throat> this index is made up of a variety of things, from clean air to clean water to open space to uh, habitat for endangered species to national parks and all kinds of things. And the general. Uh, trend that you see, uh, or a general correlation you see here then, is that the poorer the country, lower GDP, the lower the index of environmental quality, and that the richer the country, the higher the index of environmental quality. If you look at this uh, correlation for, and break it down into clean air, clean water, open space, and so on, it holds for virtually everything that anyone has ever studied. Uh, I don't, I've seen no exceptions to it. And what generally it shows is that maybe at lower ends of the spectrum, people are willing to give up income in order, uh, I'm sorry, give up environmental quality to have more income. That is to say, often this line uh, for specific resources has a downward trend in low levels. Uh, if you're living and you're getting, uh, your per capita income is $250 a year and somebody says, here, I'll raise your per capita income to $350 per year if uh, you will help me kill elephants, for example, uh, all of a sudden elephants are not a very warm, cuddly free creature that maybe you'd like to keep around. So if, you, if, if the index were elephants, you might see fewer elephants as people were willing to accept higher incomes but that at some point that curve turns in a J sort of shape and turns upward. Now we can debate where that is, and if you think about it, one of the first areas where people began to demand higher levels of environmental quality is in water. Water is one of the big factors that causes death around the world, dirty water. And so as people began to see their incomes rise, they tend to demand cleaner water. And we'll talk about whether they demand it through regulatory processes or demand it through market processes. Uh, but the point is simply wealth makes a difference. <coughs> and we also know pretty clearly from studies that have been done, especially since the demise of the Soviet Union, that if you want wealth, you had better have a system based on a rule of law, property rights, and democracy. And all of those then couple with markets. If you want wealth, those are the kinds of things you have to have. So free market environmentalism, well, free markets are what give us this, higher incomes, and higher incomes are part of what gives us not just the change in our values, but the wherewithal to articulate those changes. <clears throat> now the second point has to do with incentives matter, and the best way to think about this is that we can build perverse incentives into the system, in which case uh, we make uh, whatever it is that we're trying to, to accomplish uh, uh, disappear rather than, than uh, stick around. Uh, someone sent me this uh, picture. Uh, 
and I've used it in PowerPoints over and over. It just it captures it perfectly, okay? <laughs> uh, in fact, that if it pays, it stays rancher. I should put in here a, a, a picture I took on his property of uh, Prairie Dog Town. Uh, the Blacktail Prairie Dog was uh, considered for listing under the ESA, and uh, this guy had this Prairie Dog Town. It had about as much grass as there is on the floor in this room, and I got to thinking now, how would this rancher feel if he was told that if you have endangered species, those species are going to mean that you can't graze cattle somewhere. That prairie dog town would have disappeared very, very quickly. And in fact, if you don't believe me, let me turn to a study that was done here in North Carolina and recently made the press, uh, not the study, but, but the issue made the press that the study was focused on. And it had to do with the RCW, the red cockaded woodpecker. And you probably are more familiar with it uh, than, than, than I. But even as far away in Montana, we read the stories of people cutting down trees in order to avoid being accused of having RCWs on their property. And this goes back a long time. There's other evidence of this. <clears throat> now, in the West, you hear, with respect to wolves and grizzly bears, the notion of shoot, shovel, and shut up. Now, I don't really think there are many people out there who go out and shoot wolves and uh, dig a hole and bury them and hope they never get caught. For one thing, people who do that are usually not smart enough to do the last thing, shut up. So you walk into the local bar that night and have a few beers and say, hey, man, I shot one of them there wolves last night. And immediately that filters out and you're in big trouble. So I don't think there's a lot of the shoot, shovel, and shut up. But there may be. And... Uh, uh, the suggestion from this incentives matter is that there may be actions that people take which actually are not illegal but lead to a reduction in endangered species hack, uh, habitat. So my colleague uh, who started the study when he was uh, at, uh, at here at NC State uh, uh, thought it would be very interesting to look at uh, <coughs> what happens to the age at which we harvest pine trees relative to the number of red cockaded woodpecker colonies in the area. And his hypothesis was the following. If you've got a bunch of birds lined up on the telephone line next to your property looking for a home, and you think they're about to move into your forest, maybe you ought to cut those trees now rather than let them move in. Because if they move in, you are taking the species by taking their habitat. If they aren't there yet, then you can't be necessarily accused of taking the species. And so what Dean found in his study was, whoops, sorry, back to the Hank Fisher. Uh, he, he looked at areas where there were no colonies and found that the average age of harvest was just under 60 years. So these are pretty old trees. He found that if there were 25 colonies in a 25-mile radius around the harvest sites that he looked at, the average age was about 35 years. And if there was the densest populations, 437 colonies, that the average age fell to around 16 years. One person in this area said, the, the Endangered Species Act has taken old growth trees and turned them into pulpwood. Now, Dean Control for a lot of other things. It's a refereed journal article now. Uh, it's a well done statistical piece. It isn't just a matter of, of the correlation shown in this two-dimensional graph. Uh, so there are a lot of other control variables in here. The point is that this is, this is the only study I know of that looks at the sort of shoot, shovel, and shut up hypothesis and finds that indeed it appears to be happening here in North Carolina with respect to RCWs. The result, the question then ought to be, what can we do about this? How can we change the rather perverse incentives that are created if we say to the person, you've created habitat, we're going to penalize you? <coughs> And Hank Fisher, I want to come back to him now. Uh, Hank Fisher, this is a picture of Hank who wrote that book, The Wolf Wars, uh, who was instrumental in the, the wolf reintroduction. Uh, I think of Hank often as the wolf man. Uh, Hank Fisher understood this incentive problem even before he walked into that cafe in Ashton, Idaho. And Hank understood that in a sense he was saying to the ranchers who had those cattle or sheep out in those public lands, or private lands for that matter, uh, we're asking you, we the environmental community is asking you to provide uh, burritos, if you will, a free lunch uh, for the wolves. And so Hank said, understanding that, I ought, we ought to do something to 
at least level the playing field. And what Hank did was get Monty Dolak, a, an artist in Missoula, Montana, to paint a picture, a stylized uh, view of wolves in Yellowstone, make it into a poster, and sold those posters for $35 each. Within a year, Hank had amassed well over $100,000, put it into a bank uh, in an account held by Defenders of Wildlife, and said, look, if wolves kill your lambs, your calves, we'll pay for those losses. Now, some ranchers you know, would send their cows out into the woods, 100 cows out into the woods in spring, gather them in the fall, 90 would come back. Hey, Hank, I lost 10. Send me a check. Now, Hank wasn't quite willing to do that. He understood that there were moral hazard problems and so on. Uh, so he set up a system whereby the state <coughs> livestock agency had to convert, confirm that the kill was a wolf kill. If the livestock agency, arguably in the pocket of the ranchers, said, yes, it's a wolf kill, he would write the check. They have managed to maintain the corpus of that account, see it grow some, and pay all the bills that have been confirmed as a result of wolf kills. Hank understood that we needed to take away the perverse incentives. <coughs> he was trying to find a way to make the rancher whole and not make the wolf the enemy. Now, Hank is uh, no longer with Defenders of Wildlife, and I might add as a footnote here, he left Defenders in part because Defenders was starting to back off of it as an environmental group paying the bill and saying, well, the federal government should pick up the tab. And Hank was worried that it would do two things. One, tremendously increase the transaction cost for the rancher. So now you've got to deal with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to get the money. And two, that if you didn't make a direct link with the people who wanted the wolves and the funding, it wouldn't be as effective. Uh, so Hank, Hank left Defenders and is now with uh, the National Wildlife Federation. And he's continued his march toward free market environmentalism by looking at another issue. And here you see a bison. Now, actually, this is not really a bison. This is a barrel of pollution. And this barrel of pollution sometime oozes across the property boundary of the property owner. That is to say, this barrel of pollution sometimes walks across the border of Yellowstone into other lands. Some are national forests, some are private. What's the pollution? Well, bison carry brucellosis. And brucellosis can be transmitted to cattle, even to humans, can be transmitted to cattle. When cattle get brucellosis, they abort their fetus. <clears throat> That's bad enough, but to make it even worse, the agency of the federal government that certifies whether cattle are brucellosis free and hence can be transported across state lines, does that certification on a statewide basis. So imagine a map of Montana, Yellowstone's down here in the southwest corner. If one cow in the southwest corner of Montana contracts brucellosis, every cow in the northeast corner, 800 miles away, is now no longer certified brucellosis free and cannot be marketed across state lines. Well, imagine how the ranchers up here in northeastern Montana think about these barrels of pollution. They are not happy to see them migrate out. And so we do all kinds of things like we have a, in quote, hunting season in Montana for bison when they leave Yellowstone. If your name is drawn, you get to go out there and this dumb bison, I mean, they're not all that dumb, but they're dumb when it comes to hunting because they've never been hunted. They step across the Yellowstone line and Buana wearing the big orange hat is out there with a big game rifle and shoots them. Now, of course, his buddies all run back into Yellowstone. Uh, they're quick to figure out that line. Uh, the point here is we're not dealing with it very well. Hank said, well, look, the problem is that when this thing goes across, the harm that it's causing is being caused because there are cattle out there. If there weren't cattle out there, we wouldn't have to worry because the pollution wouldn't be a problem because nobody would be harmed. And so Hank took it on himself <coughs> with the National Wildlife, Feder or, uh, yeah, National Wildlife Federation to begin raising money with the intent of retiring grazing on public lands around Yellowstone. And he did it both for the bison problem as well as wolf and grizzly bear uh, confrontation. Recently, Hank purchased a grazing allotment from a sheep rancher, the largest uh, a sheep rancher uh, in, in southern Montana who had the last permit in this part of the wilderness, purchased it, retired it, and said, look, we're getting rid of grazing. 
We're not totally getting rid of it, rather. We're redistributing where it occurs. And he provided grazing for other, uh, in other areas. Point here is, Hank was trying to find a way to recognize the property rights of the grazers and say, because of changing demand, increased wealth, we want to buy your property rights and uh, put them to a different use. Let me give you a couple other quick examples and then wrap up. Uh, <coughs> take a look at water issues. Here we might, I call them dam dams. Uh, we built dams across the West for the purpose of making the desert bloom like a rose. <coughs> well, we did it. It works pretty well. And we did it by subsidizing the delivery of water to one use, namely agriculture. Quickly, what these data show is the most recent of, uh, of these big federal projects, the Central Utah Project. This, this bar here shows the cost of delivering an additional acre foot of water, approximately, to ranchers in Central Utah. A little over $300 per acre foot. This didn't count the cost of the dams. This was just the canals and the pumps and so on. Uh, this little tiny bar over here shows what farmers were paying for that water. You and I are spending $300 an acre foot. Farmers are paying about $6 an acre foot to get it. Now, if you're a farmer and you're paying $6 and you're producing crops that are worth something around $30 an acre foot for the additional water, you think this is a great deal. You pay six, you get 30. You don't need to be an economist or an accountant to figure that one out. This is a good deal. On the other hand, if you're at this end of the transaction, all of us in this room, unless you're one of the central Utah farmers, you're paying $300 to give this person water that will generate $30 in value. Now again, if the marginal, eh, you don't even have to go through it, right? This doesn't make sense, and yet this captures every single federal project I've ever looked at in the West. We shouldn't therefore be surprised to find pictures like this one from the Kalamath, where we're subsidizing the diversion of water to agriculture to make the desert bloom like a rose, and ending up with dead fish. Well, what can we do about it? Well, we can fight over it, as we did in the Klamath, or we can engage in water markets. Uh, this graph shows what's happened both to the quantity, the little droplets, and the dollar spent acquiring water from off-stream uses to put it back in-stream. These are 1997, uh, up to 1997 data. Uh, in, late next month, there'll be a new study updating these numbers from PERC. And when, you, when we update them, they're just going to continue on an upward trend. Environmental groups around the West, the Oregon Water Trust, the Montana Water Trust, and others are using markets and recognizing the property rights of the farmer to uh, accomplish what they want. And we can do the same thing, and again, these are some data from uh, <coughs> here in North Carolina, with respect to pollution. Using cap and trade, that is systems whereby we establish property rights for people to emit, <coughs> and this has been used in the sulfur dioxide markets. Uh, so we, we issue permits for people to, to emit into the environment, cap the level, and then allow people to trade, and we get much more efficient results. These are the data for the cost of re reducing pollution in the Tar Pamlico with a cap and trade sort of system. If EPA had been allowed to come in and use the standard regulatory approach for bringing the Tar Pamlico into compliance with EPA standards, the cost would have been somewhere around $100 million. Thanks to the Environmental Defense Fund, and it was the fund at the time, now Environmental Defense, they came in and said, look, if we would cap the amount of pollution and let us find cheaper ways to reduce it, namely pay the pig farmers to not emit pollutants into the Tar Pamlico, we could do it much cheaper. And the net cost then of reducing pollution under a cap and trade were much, much lower. Let me wrap up with a couple of quotes uh, <coughs> to suggest that this notion of using markets, recognizing property rights, and engaging in trades is catching on. Lee Perkins, the uh, owner of the Orvis Company, <coughs> said in his autobiography that the environmental movement will have to rely more and more on market solutions if it wants to solve problems. <coughs> this is the wave of the future. And if you don't believe Lee Perkins, capitalist, then go back and think of the great conservation leader, Aldo Leopold, who's known mostly for his notion of there being a, a land ethic, a, a, an ethical foundation for how and why people should conserve resources. But Leopold was an economist, not by training, but by common sense. And he said, if we don't figure out ways to reward the person who does the public good, in a sense, the public interest, 
then we're not going to achieve it solely with the conservation ethic. And so I want to wrap up then, and I want to do so by uh, my last hat here. I thought I'd put on my uh, lawyer's hat and, and talk just about what this might mean to all of you. First off, thinking in terms of property rights is a crucial part, I think, of thinking of how we resolve environmental problems. That isn't to say we can always establish property rights or know what they are, but if we always think in terms of who has what rights, we'll better understand why there's opposition to what it is we're trying to do or better understand how we might bring markets to bear. Uh, if we do that, then, then we can get our focus somewhat away from the regulatory approaches that dominate virtually all environmental <coughs> policy, and that requires thinking of how we might define and enforce property rights. And as an example, uh, on the plane out here yesterday, I was reading a paper by uh, Jim Huffman, a law professor at Lewis and Clark, formerly the dean, uh, now uh, retired from that and back to scholarship, looking at the public trust doctrine. And I won't spend time on it unless you want to in Q&A, but only will say that here's a doctrine that says uh, things like water and wildlife belong to all of us in common, and therefore we have to use regulatory approaches. And the question becomes, are there ways we can get away from this notion of it belongs to all and, and use regulation, but rather use markets? And the way that lawyers can contribute in a valuable uh, way to markets is to try to clarify the property rights. What we found in states like Montana and Wyoming is that because the property rights are rights to divert water, then you can't have a market to get the water back in stream because I can't buy your water and leave it in stream. Your right is only a right to divert. We have, through a good deal of, of pressure from the legal community and the environmental community, changed the rules in Montana so that now those rights are water rights. And if I want to go and purchase a diversion right, I can leave it in stream, hence the graph that I showed you before. I think that if you will follow the kinds of ideas that come with free market environmentalism, you can avoid what happened in the Colorado mining camps where anyone wearing this hat and caught practicing law was given 30 lashes and forever banished. Thank you very much. <laughs>
you know, I, I don't uh, throw my beer cans out the window. Well, I can't drive in Montana with an open container, so I wouldn't do it now. Uh, it used to be when we were really a free state, we could actually drive with open containers and drink, but now we can't. Uh, anyway, I don't throw them out the window, and it isn't because I'm worried about the fine. It's because I feel that that's not an appropriate thing to do. So I do think those are important. Uh, I don't want to be in a counter situation where this market approach doesn't work. I'm sorry, I didn't. Well, uh, you know, often I, I give a lecture like this, and the first question is, well, if you're so smart, how would you deal with climate change, global warming? And my response is, if I were that smart, I wouldn't have to be here, right? I'd be out, uh, and I'd be a rich person. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a, a solution to the, the climate change issue that, that revolves around market. Even cap and trade, which a lot of people uh, promote. I'm not very sanguine about the potential for that. Because climate change involves international borders, not just, not just Yellowstone Park and, and uh, <coughs> private property borders, not just Montana-Wyoming borders, but international borders and international borders that aren't just U.S. and Canada type, where at least there's some possibility of a little friendly negotiation. I don't see a good way to establish a cap and trade and really enforce that system. If we say, if we follow Kyoto and say, all right, we're going to cap and we're going to give India this much and U.S. this much, and India thumbs its nose at the cap and says, forget it, uh, I, I don't quite know what we do about it. Uh, so that's one where I really am not very optimistic. And certainly uh, some of my hardcore libertarian colleagues say that even cap and trade is just market socialism. So, uh, and, and yet, I, you know, my response to that is, well, uh, look at Tar Pamlico. Using a cap and trade approach is is certainly much more effective. Uh, but if you get to if if you know if you want to be pure and you want to use the Hank Fisher model of, okay, we'll reintroduce wolves and we the private environmental community will raise the funds and pay the rancher. It's not a perfect system. There is what economists call the free rider problem. How many of you purchased a Hank Fisher poster? Two of us, right? <laughs> So the rest of you sleaze bags out there who are free riding on a couple of us who really have a strong conservation. So yeah, my point is just, have, had, did Hank really raise enough money because of the free rider problem? There, there are a lot, lots of issues that, that, that condition how effectively markets work. Ultimately, however, my, my conclusion is, if we can apply it to things like water markets and wolf reintroduction, think of what energy we release to solve because we've solved those easy problems with markets, what energy we release to the tougher problems that I can't give you the market solution for. Um, I would like to know where you see the optimum connection between regulations and free market systems, because it seems to me like the cap and trade, um, there wouldn't be a market for the ability to pollute unless there were regulations that first said this is bad. So what, what's the interaction between those two things? Well, uh, great, great question. Uh, are we out of time? Because it's hard. Uh, uh, well, I get I, uh, two, two responses. My first would be that in, in a pure property rights market common law uh, framework, we would imagine that that bison belonging to you crossing your border onto my property would then involve a lawsuit between the two of us to show harm and all the other kinds of, of things that would come with, with a common law solution. And so we don't need a regulation in that pure world. I think that we have given short shrift to common law solutions for many of these tougher problems involving pollution. And we could gain a lot more and reduce the regulatory burden if we relied more on common law solution. Uh, Jim mentioned Bruce Yandel, who's written a good deal on this. Uh, and, and so so I think that's, we could push the frontiers of common law in ways that I think would, would help reduce then the frontiers of the regulatory solution. That said, it's, it's not quite so easy when it comes to things like an endangered species to simply say, well, uh, you cut down trees, and uh, that has caused harm to me, the owner of RCWs. I don't own them. And so how do we establish a common law 
property rights approach to that. In those settings, uh, we just had a, a, a meeting at PERC with involving uh, 10 leaders of environmental groups talking about how can, we, how can we find more market solutions and where can we sort of lock arms and move forward with market approaches. And one of the points that came up over and over was that were it not for things like the Endangered Species Act that sort of whacked us in the face and says, hey, do we have your attention yet? We wouldn't have even, we wouldn't have people like Hank Fisher finding market solutions. So I think that the, the regulatory, uh, the, 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 the value in the regulatory system is not just in that it might uh, help us save an endangered species or help us reduce emissions at the, at the smokestack, but that it also raises a sort of consciousness, and maybe this is back to the ethic in a sense, uh, a consciousness that's then, that then catalyzes uh, the, the, the environmental, the free market environmentalists to find better solutions. Um, this is in reference to the draft you showed with the CDC. Speak up a bit. If the draft CDC and the you want me to go back to my graph? No, no, it's okay. Oh, I'm just okay. <laughs> giving a visual. Um, I know that with lesser developed countries, you know, obviously it's hard to think about the future with environmental protection. <clears throat> but as far as like their day to day problems with finding clean water sources and food to eat, doesn't it seem like that, if being the pressing issue that that is, and it's also linked to environmental problems, don't you think that there's going to need to be a solution that's found without using market sources? Because those countries don't operate in a free market economy. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you look at that uh, line as a static line, uh, it, you're really ignoring uh, how dynamic it is. And what happens to that line is it shifts down over time. And it shifts down because as we develop technology in richer countries to solve water, say, water pollution problems, that technology is much cheaper than for the country that's down at the low end so that now they can actually get a, uh, I'm sorry, it shifts, shifts, shifts upward, not downward. They can get for the same level of income, they can get a higher level of environmental quality, okay, because of technology transfers. That, that might be market technology, it might be World Bank technology transfers, it might be all kinds. So that, that's, that's point one. Point two is that, I, I, and, and I, uh, I sort of used a sleight of hand here, I didn't, didn't I, I gave you the correlation between income and environmental quality. But the, the question I think you're raising is, well, how much of that is due to markets and how much is due to regulation and whatever other kinds of things might bring that about? And certainly when it comes to less developed countries, uh, or, so, sorry, certainly when it comes to developed countries, regulations have pe played an important part. We can afford, living as we do, to say, clean up that last dollop of pollution that you dumped in. If you're in a developing country, that isn't quite so easy because people are saying, well, you know, that may mean less income. And so in the developing world, I think it's even more important that we concentrate on those factors that lead to economic growth. And I, again, rule of law, property rights are two, and, and to the legal community, two that are crucial to economic development. And included in those property rights needs to be a property right for that poor person to a healthy environment, clean water then we'll either get regulatory or market solutions, one of the two. What's interesting as well is when you look at, um, at drinking water uh, in, in, in developing countries, the very poorest actually rely on market solutions. They buy their, their water from vendors uh, because they're not hooked up to the infrastructure. You know, they live in squatter settlements and such. Yeah. And, and we get so locked into this notion that somehow you know, there has to be the city that provides all of the hookups to every single house and all the clean water and so on. But as Jim suggests, uh, you know, that infrastructure just isn't going to be developed in, that, in, in those poor countries. Yeah, one of the, or several of the examples you used, Terry, especially with regard to the Endangered Species Act, really focused on what we call charismatic megafauna, so the wolves, the bison. What role can markets play in protecting, um, recovering even some less attractive species that might have, although they might not be, you know, good candidates for posters, might have good you know, biodiversity value or medical value, something like that, that might not be realized. <coughs> I, I think there are two roles that, that, that voluntary uh, conservation, is, if, if we don't want to call it free market environmentalism play, 
One role is that when we take care of charismatic megafauna, it usually means we're taking better care of the overall habitat and providing, you know, places for fungi to grow and, and spiders to weave their webs. Uh, so that's, that's one part that comes with the, these, uh, these market approaches to if it pays, it stays. The second part is that it's the, the, back to the ethic that Jim talked about. I can't remember the name of it. There's some bat society. And they go out and buy caves, buy old mines for bats. Now, I can't think of anything a whole lot less charismatic than a bat, but to some people, they're really cool things. And they're using a market approach by providing habitat for, for certain bats. Uh, uh, I, d I would not want to make the case that all non-charismatic megafauna are going to register highly in, in, this, in this ethical construct and hence uh, make us open our pocketbooks. Uh, by the same token, I'm not very sanguine that the political process is going to be very worried about those bats. Let's take two more questions. I, for a while. <coughs> say, I mean, it, your description sounds like environmentalism is a luxury good, and in that case, can poor countries ever actually catch up with wealthier, with wealthier countries? If it's a matter of, you know, we can afford to give up more GDP, it seems like there's never going to be parity. Hmm. Well, <laughs> this, this really opens a, a, a tremendous debate about development for one thing, I think, and, it, and it's a crucial part, I believe, of the, the environmental factor. And that is, how, what can we as wealthy countries do to help the developing world develop? And uh, on the way out, Monica and I were reading an article by, uh, 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 out of the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, looking at African countries and saying, you know, we feel really good when we send them a little aid and we, you know, give them some medicine or we send them another bag of corn. But his point was, you know, that doesn't get at the fundamental problem of why they're poor and we're rich. And, and so I come back to, we need to think of how we can help them develop institutions that will encourage uh, the economic growth. And that will do more to take away that differential. The second point is that if we're going to give them uh, aid of sorts, then the, back to my point about technology, transferring the kind of technology that really allows them, without going through everything we had to go through, to get cleaner water and cleaner air for two uh, is a way to help them catch up so that for the same level of income, even if they don't increase their income, they get a higher level of environmental quality. So those are two things I think help uh, mitigate against the differential. But ultimately, we want to do things that would make them rich. And that, I think, is, is strictly an institutional issue, how we get the right the institutions that have made us wealthy to other countries, and it isn't a simple matter of just saying, uh, "Well, here, here, here's a you know three cups of capitalism and 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 two units of private property rights." That doesn't doesn't uh, or we'll get <coughs> democracy. I won't go into any farther with that. <laughs> okay, one more question. And we've got the room till one thirty. So after after this question, person can come down and chat chat for a bit. It seems like the suggestion. Sorry. <clears throat> It seems like the suggestion that you just made for poorer countries <coughs> with technology transfer almost undermines the idea of free markets and property rights. Because somebody had to create that technology, somebody had to think up that technology, and they initially, under our domestic system, would have a property right in that. And by transferring that technology to a poorer country at a below market cost, it seems that you're undermining that property, right? And I was wondering if you could comment well, on that. Well, I, I, I definitely am not suggesting that we not recognize uh, IP and, and uh, uh, simply steal ideas and, and give them to other people. I, you know, I, I, uh, that, that is not my suggestion. My suggestion is more that, that if we're going to have uh, some sort of international policy as a, a part of U.S. diplomacy, uh, that going out into the marketplace and helping companies that have developed this this intellectual property that now has value in these areas, helping them sell that either to to our government that then gives it away, but uh, or to other entities there that might utilize it is is the way to go. I, I definitely you know the last thing we want to do is under undermine the, the IP because if we do, then we don't get it even in the rich world. So I, I wasn't suggesting that we do it in a way other than 
through uh, a market process, even if it's a subsidized one. Okay, I mean, obviously, the, the, the issues that Terry's been talking about are sort of hot button issues, not just for environment, but also as we've seen for development. Uh, and so, on behalf of the Environmental Law Society and the Federal Society, join me in thanking Terry. Thank you very much.